hip, hip, hooray for DNA. It provides the key to the plans for making everything in you and me. Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about Punnett squares and use Punnett squares to estimate the actual genotype frequency and phenotype frequency. We're going to do in this video, we're going to cover the next top point, which says students will perform a first investigation to construct pedigree trees or family trees, trace the inheritance of selected characteristics, and discuss their uses. Before we start, I'm going to quickly go over what these pedigree trees are or what they allow us to do. If you actually visualize just any family picture, what you'll probably notice is a couple of things. First of all, there's quite a few resemblance, which means we have shared characteristics. It might be the same smile or it might be the same hair color or the same straightness or curliness of the hair. These are often shared within some of the members of the actual group. And within a family, there's also variation, so there's differences. Some of the differences might be, so for example, you might have a feature or a trait which none of your siblings have, and not, even sometimes none of your parents have, or there might just be slight differences, but usually within a family there are resemblances and variations. And the reason why inheritance and genetics, the reason why that's an interesting topic to study, is because it's very related to human beings, and we can see you know, why we look and why we are the way we are, because of genetics. So that's there. We have resemblance and we have variation, and this, constructing this pedigree tree allows us to see where that comes from, why we have that happening. So before we first, we'll go for the first part, which was to construct pedigree trees. And what we should know for that is we should have a couple of things. First of all, we should know what to, to actually draw. So there are a couple of different symbols you should know. We have this square symbol, which represents a unaffected male, because we're talking about characteristics, we're talking about selected characteristics. So for example, if we're talking about maybe disease, this white square means that person does not have that disease. This male does not have that disease. Whereas a round white means it's an unaffected female. So whatever characteristic we're looking at, this female does not have that characteristic. Whereas if we have a pink one, that means the actual person, in this case the male, because it's a square, is affected, so he has that, that trait. Whereas if it's round and purple, it means that it's actually an affected female. And if it's this kind of star shape, diamond shape, that means there's no sex. So it could be female or male, we just don't know. So those are the first things you should know. You should know what the color and the shape of females and males are, and the affected and unaffected ones. Next, we should also know what we actually, for example, what we do when it comes to marriage and descent. So what this means is this here would be a male as we established earlier. This would be a female. And this line here is the marriage line. So what that means is that these two are married. Now this here, if it goes down, that means that's descent line. So that means they have had offspring, they've had children. And how are these here linked to these top ones? Well, they're going to be the, the actual children of the pair, the pair, the marriage pair. So these will be together. These relationship between these three are their siblings, and these three are also the children of the top two. So these would be the siblings. This would be a sister of this one here. This would be a brother. And this would, would be the brother sister as well. Now we should know that. We should know what the marriage line looks like and the descent line. And we should also know what we actually give them in terms of numbers. So we have Roman numerals. Those are no Roman numerals that we assign to generations. So for example, this here is the first generation that we're looking at. So we assign that a Roman symbol one. And then these have a children, so this is the second generation. So we would assign them Roman symbol two for that whole generation. And next we also have to actually give normal numbers, so from one to 10, to assign numbers within a generation. So we might say this is number one of that generation, this is number two of that generation, and they've obviously had children. And then these are, here are, this might be the oldest sister, that might be the second oldest, and the youngest. So we have to assign numbers within a generation, and we have to assign generation numbers. Roman numerals for generation numbers, and within generations, just normal numbers. So these are more or less the rules when it comes to constructing a pedigree tree. And now it says construct a pedigree tree for, or family trees that are relevant. So what I'll do, I'll actually construct a pedigree tree that is to do with my family. And the trade we're looking at, because I have to talk about trade, 
is attached earlobes and free earlobes. And what we can do, once we've constructed a tree, we can actually figure out which one is recessive and which one is dominant. And so I'll go for that now. So if I draw a white one, that means the person has no free ear, has a free earlobe, doesn't have attached earlobes. If I draw a pink one, that means they have attached earlobes. So both my father and mother, so this is meant to be my father, and this is meant to be my mother. They're both white because they have had the free earlobe. They did not have attached earlobes. And this is the marriage line because they have married. And then I assign Roman numeral 1 because it's generation 1. And the numbers 1 and 2. Now they've had children. They actually, they, I have three siblings. So they had three siblings. This is the scent line. So this means that they've had offspring, the scent line. And they've had four children, because I have three siblings. Now my young, my oldest brother, he is unaffected. He does, he has three earlobes, so he gets a white one. I actually have attached earlobes, so I am affected. Because that's what we're looking at. And my younger brother, next one, has three earlobes. And my younger sister also has free earlobes. So generation two, the only one who's affected by this attached earlobes, which sounds freaky, but trust me, it's just it's very small. So it just means you have a tiny bit being attached as opposed to not being attached. So even though attached earlobe sounds freaky, it's not really that freaky. Um, so we have this, and then we have to assign the Roman numerals. So because my older brother is one, two, three, four. I'm number two in that generation, so I'm the second oldest. And now what we can do, we can figure out the actual genotypes. So, and which one is dominant and which one is recessive. So then, obviously, it must have had, within the, it must have had the allele for the actual attached earlobe, because I have attached earlobes. But from the looks of it, it looks like it's recessive, because they didn't have it. And then my siblings didn't have it, but I had it. So, through that, we can figure out, we can guess what kind of alleles they've had. So if I, if I say, okay, we're going to use F, capital F, stands for free earlobes, and small f stands for attached earlobes, and we're just guessing that because we can see that pattern of just me having attached earlobes, even though my actual mother and father didn't have it. That it must be small f, so that must mean it's recessive. And if we guess that, so for example, if we say my mom had was must have been heterozygous for the attached earlobe, so what that means it has one capital F and one small f. My dad must have been that too. That's the only combination that makes sense to produce this here, because in this case, it must mean that I am. I've gotten one F, the small F from my father and a small F from my mother. Whereas with the other ones, so with my siblings, we don't know if they're heterozygous or homozygous. So what I mean by that is we don't know if they're either capital F and small F or capital F or and big F. So if they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous. We don't know that, so we have we have to actually say both. So they're either this or this for number one, for my oldest, youngest brother, and youngest sister. I see. You put that under each of their names, and now we've established. We've actually managed to not given any information. We've managed to establish which one was the recessive one. So the actual uh, attached earlobes were the recessive ones, and we managed to establish the probable genotypes for everyone in my family based on the likelihood of this happening. And what I can do as well, sometimes they ask these questions, they ask you what happens if, for example, number two, which would be me, would be crossed with a certain person. Obviously, when it comes to humans, you don't usually use the word crossed, it's a bit weird. But I'll just say, um, I'm just gonna, I'll say I use the word crossed. So if, for example, this is me, because I am homozygous recessive, this is me, and I'm crossed with some random female who happens to be heterozygous for, attached earlobes, so he has both. 
So what we do now is we obviously we can just use the if if, if the question itself asks what happens if that happens, we can just put the actual alleles in and then work it out that way. We're using a Punnett square, right? So that's a Punnett square. So just again, always attach one to the other. So in this case, the f from the female and the small f from me, the small f from me and capital F, uh, sorry, small f from the female, and so on and so on. And what you'd find is if this were the actual ratio, then the likelihood of producing offspring or babies, again, we don't usually use the word offspring when it comes to humans, we say babies, but the likelihood of babies having attached earlobes would be this one would have attached earlobes and this one would have attached earlobes and these would not. So it would be a two to two ratio or a simplified a one to one ratio. So if I had children with someone who was heterozygous for attached earlobes, that would mean that every second child would also have attached earlobes. Right, so now we've established so all these kind of questions or might be questions you could get using the, the extra pedigree trees. And then the last part says discuss the current use. So there's two main uses. So it's determining risk of passing on genetic disease. So for example, because I have attached earlobes, it's not a very serious condition at all. I mean, I'm not freaked out by it and it doesn't cause me any harm. So I wouldn't probably, I wouldn't, you know, take any, I mean, if someone said, you know, if you had children with this person, you might get, your children might have attached earlobes. Like I wouldn't really care. It's not a big thing. But if maybe there's a certain disease that they might get, some of them are genetic, quite a few diseases are genetic, like Hutchinson disease. If that risk says, okay, if you have children with that female or that woman, um, then you would actually have a risk of transmitting the genetic disease and your children might have these diseases. So instead of being affected by earlobes, you might be affected by you know, genetic diseases. That'd be different, so people might be a bit more hesitant. They might actually say, okay, we won't actually have children because the risk is too high of having passing on a disease, not just you know, making make it heterozygous, but maybe may making it um, dominant. Or some actual diseases are also, if you have dominance, you still have the disease. So overall, that's one of the main reasons we, we use it, to risk manage or to see what kind of risk there is in having children that have a disease, especially if you have family history of that disease. Another one way is just to find out likelihood of passing on a trait. This is just more for general fun or interest, to see you know what traits you have and then your partner has, and then are they recessive or dominant, and what likelihood of your baby looking like this or this would, would there be. But um, that's obviously, again, that's more just out of curiosity as opposed to something really used quite scientifically. But the first one is a major use. So determining if there's a risk of passing on a genetic disease, if there's a high risk, often couples choose not to have babies. I hope that makes sense. But yeah, what you need to be able to do is you need to know what these signs are. You need to be able to know how to construct one of these trees. So always, you know, don't forget the actual numerals. Don't forget the descent line and the marriage line. And... If sometimes you get questions, you know, if this person had a if this person had a child with this person, what would be the likelihood of passing on the trait? Then you would have to just use a pedigree tree, a, a Punnett square. I hope that's useful. Thank you for watching.